Hello, everyone. Uh, this is June Halper from the Consortium of MS Centers. I'm pleased to welcome you to, was the second or third, I've lost track, um, a session on Advanced Perspectives in MS. It's a virtual journal club series for advanced practice MS clinicians. That was a lot to say. Um, next slide. It's my pleasure tonight to be joined by Brian Walker, whose uh, initials are MHS, PAC, MSCS, and uh, Brian is from the Duke University of uh, the Division of MS and Neuroimmunology. And on the slide, you can read his disclosures. And John Kramer, who's from Nashville, Tennessee, he works uh, with STMP Neurology, and his disclosures are there as well. Obviously, um, we are pleased to address a very, very important topic, a topic that's in the news every day, 24 hours a day, actually. But we're very pleased that we received educational grants from Celgene Corporation, which today is Bristol Myers Squibb. I'm not sure um, how they want to be acknowledged, but I'll just leave it at that. EMD Serono, Genentech, Mallin Crack Pharmaceuticals. And we're very, very proud to be able to present you this information tonight. Um, the accreditation statement is on your screen. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can see that um, it's uh, very comprehensive, and you can certainly refer to it on our website, uh, www.mscare.org slash scholar. The article title is right on your screen. We're, be, we're going to be addressing COVID-19 pandemic, and I'll turn it over to our speaker tonight, Brian, welcome. Thanks, June. I really appreciate that. And thanks uh, for the opportunity to present this topic this evening um, and uh, for all the support that, that you've given uh, us throughout this entire time and, and being flexible uh, with, um, uh, with everything that's going on and, and really uh, providing some uh, great and enriching um, content uh, virtually uh, so we can all still stay connected even though we can't be connected. Um, and uh, I also want to um, uh, thank you for uh, the uh, incredible work that you've done uh, throughout the years with CMSC to, to bring everybody together within the care team for comprehensive care for, for persons living with MS and, and their caregivers. And um, I, I do want to address just, just a moment to, to recognize one other uh, significant contributor over the years, and, and that was uh, Dr. Sue Bennett. Uh, many of you saw the email that went out from, from June uh, this afternoon um, announcing the um, <clears throat> unfortunate passing of, uh, of Dr. Bennett uh, earlier on this month. Uh, Sue certainly was a, a pioneer in the field of rehabilitation for, for persons living with MS and uh, was the founder of a physical therapy practice that <clears throat> 28 years later still remains a, a leader in, in, in treating uh, folks with this condition. So. Uh, we're certainly going to miss uh, uh, Sue quite a bit um, and, and her contributions, but uh, they, they will still live on uh, for, for a long time to come and, and will certainly carry on her, her tradition and hopefully carry on her tradition here tonight as well by, by being very inclusive with, with everybody who's on and, and we're certainly happy for everybody who is on. So we thought that it would be timely to, to discuss um, a, a very recent uh, article that was uh, uh, put out um, <laughs> three months ago, which certainly seems like a lifetime ago, uh, and, and that is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the use of MS uh, disease-modifying therapies that was uh, put out by uh, uh, Dr. Giovanoni and, and colleagues in MS and uh, related disorders. Um, and it's kind of difficult to, to try to do a, a journal club um, virtually, but you know we've actually done this before. And uh, we, we, as June said, have done it twice before uh, prior to, to all the COVID craziness that, that's going on. And, and we've had some uh, good interaction with folks and we'd hope to continue that interaction here tonight. Certainly I am not um, uh, an expert or a sage on the stage or, or anything of, of that uh, matter, I, I'm just, uh, someone who has a, a, an interest in, in MS and, and taking care of persons living with MS. And um, uh, what I want to do is facilitate a conversation. Uh, if there's something that I can do, hopefully that's, that's try to facilitate a conversation. It's going to be a little bit challenging with everybody being virtual, but um, you, you should be able to see a, a question and the answer box uh, if you're logged in online. Um, and we would encourage you to uh, type in your questions 
uh, as we go along. Uh, there are some natural pauses uh, throughout the information here this evening. So as we're going along, uh, we'll, we'll try to hit those pauses and try to address questions as we go along because we want to try to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, uh, John is, is going to be um, uh, manning the, the uh, Q&A box and, and will uh, certainly interrupt me uh, as we go along if, if questions or comments come up. Um, and, and we do want to have as much engagement as possible as, as we go through these uh, discussion points. How, how I went through this uh, paper, and, and you all have access to, to this article, um, and, and hopefully some of you have read it already and, and tried to digest some of it uh, or all of it, and um, I'd like to get folks' uh, feedback and, and um, uh, thoughts about, about it as, as we go along. And I, I broke it down into different discussion points uh, as we go along. Uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting, like I said, it, it's only three months old, but it really does seem like a lifetime away. So some of the um, uh, commentary that the authors provided, I think was very uh, prophetic in, in the sense that looking back with our uh, retrospectoscopes uh, that we can put on now uh, three months into this, uh, some of them have uh, rung very true. Um, and some of them uh, maybe a little bit off the mark, but, but certainly nothing was, was completely uh, out in left field um, in the article, at least in my estimation. So we'll, we'll sort of look at uh, what some of the statements and, and discussion points were and then kind of pair that to, to what we've uh, figured out over the last three months. So what, one of the uh, very important points that I think uh, made right off the bat is that um, in an uncertain world where we do not have clear evidence base, you often have to default to scientific principles rather than using uh, the wisdom uh, of the crowd. Um, and I think that that was a, a very um, apt statement at the time. Uh, it, it also sounds like the, the start of a, of a movie trailer that would be coming out you know, in the summer you know, in an uncertain world. Uh, so, but we, we do now have some evidence, uh, and we do have some wisdom of the crowd, uh, both internationally and nationally. Um, here in North America, we do have the COVMS database, uh, which is a volunteer registry that hopefully all of you have been familiarized with. Uh, there is a, a, an equivalent um, international database as well. Uh, here for COVMS, the partner organizations are the National MS Society, uh, CMSC, and the MS Society of Canada. Uh, and have I included the uh, link um, if, if you don't already have that. So let's take a look at um, what some of those numbers are uh, as of uh, earlier on this week. Um, and if we look at the, the number of folks that have been entered into this database, uh, there's over 300. Um, and if we look at the breakdown, 290 of them are confirmed MS, uh, nine are NMOSD, uh, three are MOG antibody positive disorder, uh, three are identified as RAS and two as CIS. Uh, and then if we look at the breakdown to uh, the, the type of, of COVID-19 diagnoses, um, the 252 uh, of those uh, were, were laboratory confirmed positive and 55 of them uh, were suspected COVID-19 but not confirmed. And my guess is that we all have had uh, these cases um, pop up in, in clinic over the last uh, several weeks where uh, for whatever reason, uh, we, we really don't want to expose our, our patients unnecessarily to the, to the healthcare milieu if we don't have to. Um, and we might not have the availability of, of drive-through testing uh, or the availability to, to get a, a laboratory diagnosis, but we have a very strong suspicion that that's what's going on. And so we're gonna, we're gonna call it COVID um, w without having a laboratory diagnosis, but, but we're pretty confident that that's the case. So, so those are the numbers uh, as of the, the beginning of the week. And, and so from this, we can start drawing on what, what some of the collective wisdom is. Um, the, the authors go on to state that COVID-19 is a pandemic and a global health crisis with the potential to kill millions of people, particularly the elderly and people with comorbidities such as hypertension, smoking, and lung disease. Now, again, at the, at the onset of this, we didn't really know all that much as to what was going on, but we were trying to make these predictions. And, and I think that um, th this particular uh, point has run true, uh, at least so far. One of the other fantastic database um, uh, resources for, for everyone to, to go to, if you haven't already, is, is the Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. 
And again, as of the, the beginning of, of this week, I, I pulled some of the, the data off of this website, which I have also listed here. Um, for global confirmed cases, almost 9 million almost 9 million confirmed cases globally uh, with, with a, a global death rate of um, 400, over 468,000. And when we look here in the United States, uh, we have uh, 2.3 million confirmed, laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases uh, with over 100,000 deaths. And uh, as many of you, um, I, can, I can remember when all of this was going on, um, you know, watching my local news and, and looking at the, the numbers uh, that were being reported um, within the state and, and closer to home, and, and they were the twos and the threes. Um, I, I clearly remember being in uh, Chicago uh, for a meeting, and uh, it was back in uh, February or, or late January, uh, and they were talking about the um, one uh, case uh, of, of COVID-19 that they were able to identify in, in Chicago. And, and I remember, you know, when I, when I went and I flew into Chicago, um, nobody was wearing a face mask. Uh, but, but two days later, when I was flying back home, face masks were all over the place. For pretty much everybody walking through that airport uh, had, a, had a face covering on of, of some sort or another. And there was a, a, a noticeable change in the tenor and the demeanor of folks um, as they were going through the airport. And, and that's when this first started. So I, I think that um, we're, we're continuing to learn more and more about this. Um, but when we look at the data from, from COVID-MS and from these other databases, we really are seeing that uh, even for, for persons living with MS, uh, one of the biggest uh, risk factors um, for, for morbidity and mortality are uh, these comorbid factors of, of hypertension, smoking, lung disease, uh, obesity. Um, so it, it doesn't seem that so far uh, we've had any signals that just having MS in and of itself uh, is, is a risk factor for COVID, uh, either contracting it or, or uh, having any comorbidities from it, nor does it seem that any of the DMTs do. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more as, as we go through this. Um, so the, the authors then go on to say that another hypothesis being considered is that moderate immunosuppression may actually prevent severe complications associated with COVID-19 infection. The severe pulmonary complications of COVID-19 infection are consistent with ARDS caused by an over-exuberant immune response to the virus. So, so the virus is actually causing uh, this, this rapid inflammatory syndrome um, that, that's causing a lot of the, especially pulmonary complications with it. Uh, but, but could also be um, causing some of the other complications, um, such as uh, anosmia that, that we can see uh, in some folks that, that have the, the virus or, or some of the GI symptoms that, that we see. And we know that a lot of the DMTs that we use uh, dampen the immune response. Um, and, and so could it be that they would dampen the immune response to the virus? Um, and, and John and I were talking earlier today uh, about the fact that um, you know, there are a couple of trials that, that are out there looking at some DMT specifically um, in, in COVID uh, and, and how they can interact and, and play with um, the, um, the, the virus response and, and its overall uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, one small study uh, was published um, uh, ahead of peer review uh, about a week or so ago um, out of Iran looking at the possible benefit of interferon beta, uh, and another one that is ongoing is, is looking at fingolimod. Um, so, so that, again, is, is encouraging. Uh, and then, uh, as John pointed out earlier today, too, the, uh, uh, the, the latest uh, information that's coming out about uh, dexamethasone. Um, so, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about um, how we're treating our patients, not only from, from an MS standpoint, but um, if, if folks uh, do have MS and are getting COVID, what does that look like? Uh, we're continuing to gather more and more information, uh, but as, uh, as uh, June uh, and the rest of us were discussing prior to, to starting off the call, uh, fortunately at this time, it, it, it doesn't look like we're seeing any significantly um, uh, uh, signals that are, that are significantly trending uh, bad. Uh, or negative for, for um, any of the DMTs at, at, at this point. So we're, we're going to dive into that a little bit more too. Um, before moving on, I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, pause here 
here briefly, um, just just to sort of check in with John and, and make sure that I'm I'm being honest with uh, with everything that we've been talking about and get an idea from from John if he has any other uh, comments or suggestions or if, or if anything is coming in from from our colleagues uh, who are who are listening in or who are joining online. Hey Brian, uh, no no questions have come in yet. Uh, the the other molecule that some of us might be familiar with that's being studied for COVID-19 is Actemra. So, you know, IL-6 inhibitor uh, drug that we should be getting some readouts from um, relatively soon. And, and some of you may be familiar with the use of uh, Actemra off-label for NMOSD. Uh, there was some data published at last year's ECRMS, positive data in, in regards to reduction in time to first relapse with that agent. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, uh, and, and so, the, the, the more and more that we look at um, what the mechanism of action or the proposed mechanism of action of, of some of these uh, disease-modifying therapies um, are, are going to be, um, you, you know, we'll, we'll sort of uh, look at what, what we know as far as the, the pathogenesis and the pathophysiology of, of COVID-19. So we know uh, as far as mechanism of action with, with some immunomodulatory medications in, in relationship to, to COVID-19. Um, uh, medications that, that don't have a, a generous effect on, on T cells uh, and the degree of, of lymphopenia are, are going to be important. Um, so what, what are some of the um, effects of a given DMT uh, on uh, T cells or are they uh, specifically B cell mediated um, or, or do they affect NK cells? Uh, do, they, do they affect um, interleukin pathways, like, like John had mentioned, uh, and do they cause lymphopenia? And, and if so, um, is it selective? Uh, and if so, is it reversible? Uh, and if so, what is the degree of lymphopenia? Uh, and, and these are all very important with regard to um, a person's ability to mount an immune response to, to a viral pathogen. Um, and, and so, the other thing that, that the authors had, had mentioned, which is going to be important looking forward, is, is what uh, the mechanism of action for these medications is in relationship to, to potential vaccine, and, and what are their uh, uh, mechanisms of action in relationship to, to currently available vaccines. Uh, we, we all want to make sure that our patients are vaccinated for um, the, the things that um, uh, we routinely want them to be vaccinated for. Uh, so whether that's a, a, a seasonal uh, um, uh, flu vaccine uh, or a pneumovax, uh, or if we're thinking about um, starting a, a particular disease-modifying therapy and, and we feel that they should be uh, immune to uh, varicella, uh, you know, what, what is that vaccine? Um, is it a live attenuated vaccine uh, or, or not? Um, and, and what does that look like? And, and what does a particular uh, molecules mechanism of action have uh, on the immune response to a vaccine, because hopefully, if we're looking at the potential for for a vaccine, which you know maybe we would get in a, in about a year's worth of time, uh, folks have been very very I think aggressive in their optimism with trying to get uh, a um, uh, a uh, vaccine up and running as as quickly as possible. Uh, but, you know, it, it is a virus, right? So it can mutate. Uh, and there's been some evidence that, that there has been some mutations already. Uh, and, and so uh, what does that look like? Is it going to look like a seasonal influenza vaccine that would change uh, year over year based on um, uh, best estimates as to what, what the strain and, and what the uh, variations of, of that virus would be? So I, I think... Um, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to keep in consideration also, again, in the back of, of our minds is what, what does that uh, mechanism of action look like, not, not only from um, a, a vaccine standpoint um, uh, uh, now, but, but in the future as, as we're looking to, uh, to get potential for, uh, for future vaccines for, for um, uh, the uh, COVID-19 virus. Hey, Brian. So, Yeah. I'll jump in there real quick. So, you know, regarding the vaccine, the, the lead candidate right now is uh, coming from a company called Moderna. And this is an mRNA vaccine, and it's only um, against the spike protein. And so, fortunately, that would uh, obviously not be a live virus vaccine. And um, 
a question did come in about uh, dexamethasone. Uh, specifically, I, I can tackle this one. Uh, th this was a study um, that has not been uh, peer reviewed yet, but it has been published. Uh, it was called the Recovery Study. And, and they basically looked at uh, the use of, I think, what most of us would think is low dose uh, dexamethasone that was given uh, at a dose of six milligrams uh, daily for up to 10 days versus. Um, standard of care for, for COVID-19 patients. And the, the primary outcome that they looked at was 28-day uh, mortality. And it, interestingly, the patients that were on ventilatory support had a, a statistical benefit in terms of um, not achieving that 28-day mortality versus patients that did not receive uh, dexamethasone. But interestingly, those patients that were not on mechanical ventilation or ventilatory support, there was no difference between the groups that received dexamethasone versus uh, controls. Great, Thank, thanks for, um, uh, for providing that additional information, John, that, that's really helpful. And, and again, it's encouraging. Uh, although, you know, what, what we do also have to keep in mind is that, um, you know, everything changes on a day-to-day -day basis and almost a minute-to-minute -minute basis. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we wanna be optimistic and, and hopeful about um, uh, some of these uh, uh, you know, small trials that that are going on. Um, we we do want to also make sure that um, you know we're we're not having a, a knee jerk reaction uh, to 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 make a, a wholesale uh, decision about um, a particular therapy or or a treatment plan. And and I think that's underscored um, throughout uh, this paper and others with regard to uh, making sure that we're looking at um, what a, a particular patient's uh, individual risk factors are. Uh, and, and treating the individual patient as an individual. Um, and so to that point, I, I think that one of the next important um, uh, aspects of, of the article were that the authors went on to say that COVID-19 will eventually become endemic and hence uh, pose a seasonal risk to patients on immunosuppressive therapies, which, which we had mentioned. Uh, but, but here's the important nugget that I, that I gleaned out of this, and that is to wait for a vaccine uh, will delay the adequate treatment of MS. And, and this is something that um, I know many of us were, were talking about when this first happened, when we sort of naively thought that, um, you know, everybody was going to stay home for two weeks and watch Netflix and, you know, put on a couple of pounds and then it would be over and we would all get back to normal. Um, and we, we were thinking, okay, well, um, are, how is this going to change how we're treating patients with MS? And then when we started to get into a bit of area of uncertainty where, you know what, this isn't going to go away in two weeks and you know what, this is going to be a longer, long haul kind of um, uh, major uh, healthcare crisis. Um, what, what is that really going to mean for our patients with MS? What, what is going to be the effect of uh, delaying uh, or um, holding back on, on treatment uh, for a person's MS versus their risk of getting COVID? Um, you know, John and I were talking about this earlier today. Uh, once, once the damage is done, it's done, right? Um, and, and we're talking about the end organ of, of the brain and the spinal cord. So, so we, we, can't, we can't repair that damage per se. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not like we, we can do a transplant. Uh, so we're, we're in this situation where if we have patients that have uh, very aggressive MS, either initially presenting or, or maybe they're, they're progressing, um, uh, do, do we really want to um, take, the, take the chance of, of saying, hey, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure what this is going to mean for a potential vaccine in the future. Uh, you know, I think we have to, to, to treat the patient in front of us and, and, and treat them appropriately. Um, you know, I had this conversation today with a patient, and I'm sure we all have over the last few weeks, where uh, they were having, um, you know, very aggressive relapses. Um, th this one known lady had uh, uh, two uh, very significant relapses um, uh, within just a couple of months from each other uh, with new and enhancing lesions uh, in high cervical cord regions and, and other very eloquent brain regions. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to sort of wait around and say, well, gee, I'm, I'm really not sure which, which DMT we're going to, we're going to move you to and, and how we're going to treat you. Uh, I, I'm going to continue to treat her as, as uh, assertively as, as I possibly can, because that's, that's brain tissue. I'm not going to get back. That's spinal cord tissue. I'm not going to get back. And, and certainly we're not going to be doing her any 
any good um, by, by holding back on these things. So, you know, they, they do go on to, to talk about the individual risk profile being multifactorial. And, and again, I think this goes back to what we've learned over the past several months, uh, and that is that uh, we need to look at uh, the, the particular disease modifying therapy that they're on uh, and, the, and the consequent immune response to it. Um, what, what does that look like given the, the mechanism of action of that particular compound? But what are some of the other um, comorbidities that, that could impact a, a patient's risk profile? Uh, do they smoke? Um, how ambulatory are they? Uh, what is their age? Um, what is their weight? Uh, do they have any other underlying respiratory illnesses uh, or cardiac illnesses um, that could potentially put them at, at higher risk for uh, comorbidities uh, and mortality? Uh, if they were to, for, uh, to, to come up with um, uh, the COVID diagnosis. So um, again, uh, for, for some patients, uh, the authors go on to, to talk about um, having their MS treated and controlled may be more important than the potential danger of being exposed uh, to and acquiring a more severe COVID-19 infection. Uh, and and it, I think it kind of goes back to uh, how we, we treat um, uh, uh, potential exacerbations uh, of MS during this time period. Um, some folks uh, uh, say, well, you know what, I, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and treat with, with steroids uh, like I normally would. Um, others say, well, you know, maybe I'm going to hold back or maybe I'm going to go to an alternative uh, therapy with, with steroids, uh, maybe using uh, high-dose oral steroids in, instead of um, uh, an IV uh, steroid regimen because um, you know, we don't want to uh, unnecessarily expose a patient to risk for going into an infusion center uh, or a hospital-based uh, infusion center in order to get those infusions. And, and I don't know how some of you all on the line have uh, managed this, but, um, you know, some, some of my patients um, were very uncomfortable uh, coming into um, uh, a, a hospital situation, uh, but some of them were also very uncomfortable uh, having home health come into their homes uh, because they knew that uh, the home health um, uh, nurse was was going into multiple homes and treating multiple patients and now that they were coming into their home. So maybe I, I'll just stop there before we start diving into um, the, the data tables um, and, and kind of see how folks have uh, managed uh, this aspect. Um, and, and John, I don't know if you, you ran into any of this over the past uh, couple of months or if anybody else wanted to chime in about this, but, um, uh, you know, how have folks, uh, you know, managed or, or uh, treated or, or uh, looked at um, an acute exacerbation and, and what were some of the barriers that, that you might have uh, run into? Hey, Brian, there, there's a question that came in um, about the, the impact of having a dampened immune system uh, related to the disease-modifying therapies at MS and potential vaccine uh, efficacy and, and I, I can tackle part of this and you can you can chime in if you'd like to uh, you know the reality is that there, there are several DMTs that that clearly uh, show a blunted immune response um, thinking specifically about uh, B cell therapy uh, Genentech did do a phase 3b study looking uh, at the vaccination responses and, and it's interesting they, they dosed patients per standard protocol and then at three months um, began to vaccinate patients uh, with various antigens. And one of them was actually a, a neoantigen called KLH. And so the, even though the immune response was uh, dampened, patients were still able to mount a response against this uh, KLH neoantigen that doesn't cause any, any symptoms or uh, disease. So, of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a, a neoantigen as well. And so I, I think it's, it's certainly possible there may be a blunted uh, response to any particular vaccine for patients on, on various uh, disease-modifying therapies. Yeah, th thanks, John. Yeah, that, that's, um, that, that, that's true. And, and so, again, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, are, are we talking about immunomodulation or are we talking about immunosuppression? Uh, and um, I, I did have some uh, correspondence back and forth with uh, Dr. Giovannoni uh, over the past few days. Um, about the article and about uh, a, a few of these topics. And, um, you know, he, he was talking about, and, and I don't know how you all on the line have, 
have encountered this, but our, our colleagues in rheumatology uh, in particular and our colleagues in, in gastroenterology and our, and our colleagues in oncology um, sort of have a different outlook in a, in a different playbook um, that, that they run by. Um, certainly, um, uh, our colleagues in rheumatology and gastroenterology uh, use a lot of um, uh, similar um, biologics, um, and, and of course, they're, they're not going to be taking their patients off of uh, uh, their disease-modifying therapies, uh, just like we're, we're not going to be taking uh, our patients off of their disease-modifying therapies. And so what, what does that look like? And even our colleagues from oncology uh, are saying, hey, look, you know, uh, we, we need to go ahead and, and continue treating our patients, and, and we're not too, too concerned. Um, as, as long as folks are, are, are trying to, uh, to the best of their ability, um, think about uh, what their, um, uh, what, what their um, uh, uh, overall risk of exposure is, right? Um, and, and so uh, if uh, you have um, a, a patient who has, uh, you know, uh, a, a good support system and, and they're able to continue to uh, socially distance and adhere to good uh, um, practices with uh, hand hygiene and masking and so forth. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there are going to be all that much of an increased risk. However, um, that's, uh, again, in an ideal world. Um, uh, so I, I think that, um, you know, I, we have other patients who, who don't have that, right? We, we have other patients who live in a variety of, of different uh, socioeconomic conditions that uh, we, we don't have control over um, and, and they don't have control over. Uh, and so their, their risk uh, of COVID uh, might be higher um, or their risk of COVID exposure might be higher. So we have to take those things in, into consideration as well. Um, I know another question here popped up, John, that, um, uh, you know, what's, what's the new norm of, of telehealth and home infusions, and will that um, continue when, when the uh, pandemic becomes uh, endemic? And, and I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, and, and I think that certainly if we can look at one silver lining uh, throughout this whole thing is that we've been able to propel uh, telehealth and telemedicine uh, forward in several weeks that we haven't been able to do in several years. Uh, and that primarily has been driven by the payers, right? Um, historically, we've tried to provide these services to our patients, um, especially from, from a telehealth perspective with regard to, to follow-up visits and check-ins and so forth. And the reason why it hasn't taken off is because no one's going to pay for it. Uh, CMS hadn't paid for it, or when they did, it was very, very reduced, and, and private payers were not interested in, in getting involved in this as well. And that has shifted uh, very, very quickly. Um, and so now we are able to do that, and I honestly don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, we always look to CMS to see what they're going to do as far as reimbursement, and usually the private payers fall in line. Uh, sometimes begrudgingly, uh, but, but they usually do. And so right now, things are, are extended um, quite a distance out. CMS is extended, and definitely most private payers said that they're going to continue to, to reimburse um, through the end of the year. So this, I think, is something that we certainly enjoy um, uh, because we're, we're able to, to reach our, our patients who might be remote, um, and our patients are enjoying it because they don't have to risk um, – coming into the, to the clinics uh, and, and, and certainly um, uh, maybe, uh, you know, the, the long drive and the parking and, and all of the, uh, the hassles. So, um, you know, that also kind of comes to uh, another uh, question that came in from uh, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. I haven't seen you for a while. I'm sorry, buddy. I miss you. Um, Stephanie says, uh, so far I've prescribed oral steroids for relapses uh, in a few patients needing them. Uh, at their request, uh, specifically to reduce potential exposure uh, in an infusion. And so, yeah, I mean, I agree, um, Stephanie. I think that uh, I, I've, I've seen some folks say, hey, look, you know, I, again, I, I'm not comfortable with, with going into an infusion site, um, and, and I'm not really comfortable with someone coming in for a home health. So I, I think, um, you know, uh, again, to that, to that other comment about, um, how we're going to look at um, home health infusions, uh, not only from, from steroids, uh, but from, from other DMTs that are infusible. 
Um, you know, they, um, I, I don't know where that's going to go. You know, I, I think the folks here are also split as to uh, what, what's going to happen with uh, potential um, uh, infusibles uh, um, moving forward as, um, uh, as, as potential um, uh, delivery systems. And, and John, I don't, I don't know if you have a, a comment on, on, on that at all. Yeah, I, I would I would echo everything you just said. I think that uh, state by state there there are different restrictions as it relates to home infusions. And um, anecdotally, here in, in Tennessee, we've really struggled with with home infusion in general, even pre-COVID. So hopefully, we'll be able to get rid of some of these unnecessary barriers to be able to treat patients with infusions uh, in the comfort of their own home. There was also a question, Brian, about um, African American uh, patients as it relates to um, COVID-19 infection, and um, there was a, a Again, not peer reviewed yet, but published um, out, of, out of NYU. Um, and they did break down ethnicity in this group, but they only looked at Caucasian patients and Hispanic patients. I can only presume there were, there were no African American patients in this particular data set. And, and there was no difference between the uh, Hispanic patients that were um, hospitalized versus not hospitalized. Um, in terms of uh, outcomes. But, but I, I think in general, I, I think we, we've all seen the, the it, in the news media, it's very clear that in general, the African-American patient population uh, has higher rates of diabetes, hypertension, uh, and the like. And clearly, we, we, we've all seen African-American patients, particularly male patients, that just don't do as well as, say, uh, Caucasian females as a, as a group. And so my, my suspicion, I would, I would hypothesize that, that in general, the patients who have MS and are African-American would probably have worse outcomes as a population compared to the Caucasian population. Yeah, and then you can get into the, the whole discussion around um, uh, socioeconomic um, disparities in, in healthcare access, um, which, which is certainly yep. uh, becoming more and more evident uh, as, as we hit uh, th this pandemic. And uh, boy, I, I tell you, I, I think a lot of things are, are going to be changing from this, and, and hopefully a lot of things are, are changing from the better, uh, and, and will hopefully drive a lot of policy change. Um, hopefully we're going to be seeing a lot of very positive policy change out of all of this, uh, not, not only for, for MS care, but, but for uh, population health in general uh, and the healthcare disparities that, that have existed for quite some time. We need to break down those barriers. We, we need to get rid of this. And, and again, kind of defaulting back to, to the payers, uh, they, they just need to make it happen, you know. Um, and uh, we, we've been trying to do this uh, for our patients for quite a long time. Uh, one, one of the other caveats with regard to telehealth is um, I know a lot of us live uh, in, in border states uh, here in North Carolina. We see a ton of patients from South Carolina uh, because that is a, a completely medically underserved uh, population, the whole state in, in general. Uh, we see a lot of patients uh, from, uh, from Virginia, uh, a lot of patients from uh, West Virginia, um, and, and from all over. And, and so uh, then there are these little caveats and, and, um, and carve-outs with regard to telehealth and uh, being licensed within the state that, that the care is being provided in. Um, and, and so far, a lot of the payers are, are relaxing those um, restrictions, and a lot of the states uh, are relaxing those restrictions. Uh, they've, they've completely suspended um, uh, those uh, regulations, at least for the time being, uh, with regard to being able to provide telehealth services um, across state lines uh, without actually having a license within that state. So, you know, ho hopefully, again, a, a lot of these things will, will start to, to break down. Um, so, so let's get into a, a couple of the slides here, um, and these are these are great discussion points. So just just keep them, keep them coming because because this is great. This is all about trying to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so um, uh, I, I believe, um, and and June would be and, and Tina would be the 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 better uh, folks to uh, be able to comment on this. But I, I do believe that that these. Uh, slides will be available to, to folks um, in an enduring format a afterwards, and, and so hopefully you'll be you'll be able to to, to get um, uh, uh, these these slides and, and sort of digest them a little bit more. Um, the, the next few slides I'm I'm, I'm not going to read line by line. They, they are they are very very data intense, uh, and as I said, Dr. Giovanoni was um, very very kind uh, to give me the updated data tables um, from the originals that were in the uh, publication. 
uh, uh, from the article from uh, from that from from today. Uh, he he gave me the updated ones uh, with with regard to um, risk stratification uh, and, and the main attributes of, of the DMTs in relationship to, to COVID. Um, and and so he he looks at at at, at risk and, and risk referring to uh, acquiring an infection uh, during an immunodepletion phase. Um, and and uh, post immune reconstitution, uh, the, the risk is low. So so he's de defining this as uh, not only um, you know uh, the the mechanism of action of, of the drug, but we also have to take in consideration what's the overall risk um, that um, uh, that the patient could could contract COVID. Uh, and, and he kind of rank ordered them. Um, and so. Interestingly, in, in the very low at risk um, uh, category, you know, he, he talks about uh, the interferons and glutirimer uh, and teraflunamide, uh, but, but he also sort of, he captures um, uh, sort of the, the higher efficacy medications uh, based on um, their immune reconstitution uh, with, with normal innate uh, and adaptive immunity. So, so what, what, what do they mean by that? Uh, if, if the lymphocyte count is uh, greater than 1,000, um, and, and what would be the uh, overall uh, risks and, and attributes? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that um, initially we were sort of hesitant to, to use any medications, and then the discussion is around, well, um, are we talking about new starts uh, or are we talking about continuation of care? And, and this is something that John and I and, and others had discussed um, earlier on as well with regard to uh, if, say, somebody is on a B-cell depleting uh, medication um, and uh, they were due for uh, another um, a dose, um, taking into consideration what the, the individual patient's overall risk is, uh, for contracting COVID, um, would it be okay to, to uh, give them their, their next round of, of medication? Um, and, you know, would, um, uh, would it be okay to, to delay it? Uh, and, and what's the risk in, in delaying it? Uh, and, and I think with regard to the, the comments about um, reconstitution uh, and, and where folks are uh, in, in regard to their immune response, that, that could certainly play, play into it. Um, everybody's practice is a little bit different, and, and if anybody has very specific thoughts around um, about delaying dosing uh, for, for continuation of a, of a particular DMT, I'd, I'd be um, interested to, to hear that. Um, but but I, I think that we can uh, pretty much uh, agree on the fact that uh, some of the older platform uh, medications being the interferons and, and glutirimer uh, we're, you know, we're, we're not really making any changes here, and, and I don't think that any of us would, would have um, reservations about the safety aspect of, of starting these medications on, on a newly diagnosed patient. I, I think we would have to struggle with, um, you know, does that now change uh, our, our treatment philosophy of, of trying to be as aggressive as possible um, so, so that we're, we're um, adequately uh, treating the patient's uh, MS. So, um, the, the next um, uh, category of folks uh, or, or, or DMTs is um, referred to as low uh, in their at-risk category, and, and he talks about um, uh, uh, dimethyl fumarate uh, and uh, the fumaric acid derivatives, I would imagine, would, would fall into this, um, uh, and, and natalizumab with uh, extended interval dosing. Um, and you know, again, I, I think we, we could sort of um, comment and, and, and talk about, you know, what our individual thoughts are um, uh, about the, the sort of proposed mechanism of action and what the immune response is. But, um, again, I, I would like to, to get input from, from some folks on the line. If, if they're doing anything different, I mean, are, are you, are you uh, uh, not uh, prescribing one of these medications or are you holding off therapy and, and, and are, are things being – uh, changed at all with your your prescribing practices. Um, I, I think one of one of the um, takeaways uh, from all of this uh, is that we hopefully we've we've made incredibly uh, significant strides in in diagnosing and treating uh, MS, uh, and and we've we've been uh, uh, stewards in 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 pushing this out uh, to the community 
uh, to get folks on highly effective medications as early as possible, that I, I hope that we don't start to, to slip back from that. I, I hope that we don't start to, to come, come down from, from that philosophy, um, especially with uh, um, what we're starting to, to see uh, with regard to, to the different medications and, and, the, and the response to, to COVID in general. Um, the authors then go on to, to classify uh, an intermediate risk level, um, and, and they had uh, talked about uh, cladribine, uh, the S1P modulators, uh, and natalizumab as standard interval dosing as, as every four weeks as, as sort of an intermediate risk category, again, based on uh, their mechanism of action uh, and um, uh, the uh, um, amount of quote unquote immunosuppression or immunomodulation uh, and, and what that looks like. Um, and, and again, I, I think there's, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, uh, again, there are uh, uh, some trials that are ongoing to look at potential um, uh, um, possibilities of, of, of these medications being used as um, uh, modifiers uh, for, for COVID infection themselves. Uh, including the S1P modulators. So I, I think that, uh, again, this, this sort of sets this up. I don't, I don't know that it really changes anything that, that we might have thought uh, pre-COVID um, with regard to risk in, in opportunistic infections. And, and a lot of this uh, data that, that was put into this table is, is based off of um, the, the clinical trial data that, that was accumulated with these different uh, medications uh, over time um, with regard to, to infectious risk um, uh, across different infectious etiologies, including bacterial and viral. Uh, and, and then they go on to talk about um, uh, uh, um, uh, intermediate slash high uh, uh, risk um, medications, such as the anti-CD20 uh, medications um, and, and the, the high risk categories. Um, being mitoxantrin, alemtuzumab, and uh, HSCT. Um, I, I don't know um, particularly anybody uh, <laughs> uh, across the different domains that, that's going to be running out for uh, HSCT anytime soon, um, unless it is absolutely positively life or death um, that, that they're trying to, to get something um, done. That's going to be a, that's going to be a hard sell. But when, when we're thinking about some of these other medications, uh, such as the anti-CD20 um, uh, directed medications, you know, what 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 does that look like? Um, and, and I think that again, I'm not sure that this really changes our our thoughts um, with with regard to it. Maybe hopefully this is um, you know uh, talking about. Um, uh, how we would move forward and, and as we, we gather uh, additional information. And, and again, I, I think I would uh, like to get the, the pulse of the, of the group here um, as to if, if they're doing anything else. Um, John, are you seeing anything that, that's popping up here? I just see that uh, uh, Marie mentioned that there was initially they had delayed Ocrevus infusions for about two months for the elderly patients who had uh, progressive MS. Yeah. Hi, Marie. <laughs> it's good to hear from you too. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, you know we've we've had patients who um, might fall into maybe a bit of a higher risk category, or maybe if they they're just not uh, quote unquote feeling it <laughs> with regard to going into an infusion site. Um, that uh, they've got some issues. And I personally wouldn't have a problem with, with delaying uh, an, an infusion of, of ocrelizumab for, uh, for a couple of months based on, on what I've, I've seen, uh, in particular with regard to, to the data um, for um, the, the immune reconstitution and, and, and how this, this medication works. Um, and, and I don't know if anybody else has any, any thoughts about that or uh, if they want to sort of push back on that at all, or or maybe or have some different thoughts, but um, uh, you know, I, I'd I'd love to love to hear that as well. Okay, hearing none. Uh, so let, let's just kind of 
wrap up. I, I know we're, we're coming towards the top of the hour and, and I do want to leave a few uh, additional discussion points uh, out there and, and see if anybody else has any comments or suggestions uh, or, um, uh, or questions. And, and that is that uh, the authors uh, go on to um, uh, surmise that clearly any decision to, to start a DNT during the COVID-19 pandemic will need to be taken carefully. And, and, I, and I like to think that we do that uh, regardless of whether or not we're in a pandemic. Um, the, the old uh, uh, edict is true, first do no harm. Uh, and I, I wanna make sure that uh, we're, we're certainly doing our patients no harm uh, during some of these uncertain times. Um, the authors then go on to comment that our concern is that the COVID-19 pandemic may trigger a large number of neurologists and patients to reconsider treatment strategy and choice of initial DMT and to opt for less effective immunomodulatory DMTs. Uh, and this change needs to be uh, considered carefully. And, and, and so I think that uh, goes back to, to what we were discussing earlier with regard to, we've made significant progress with regard to uh, how uh, we've been uh, approaching uh, um, uh, starting DMTs and, and switching DMTs given the fact that we have the availability to do so uh, and, and we want to be as, as aggressive as we possibly can in, in, in maintaining safety uh, certainly with our patients, but making sure that we're getting them on the appropriate uh, medication for, for their particular uh, disease. And finally, uh, treatment principles are evidence-based. It should not be thrown out in the context of a potential but yet unidentified risk for our patients. And, and I think, again, that, that still rings true right now. Uh, there's still a lot that we don't know. Uh, there's more that we are knowing on a daily basis, uh, and this continues to change on a daily basis. Um, and as we continue to gather more information, uh, hopefully we, we will continue um, in this vein of, of information sharing and collaboration uh, to, <laughs> to sort of steal uh, phraseology uh, from uh, the uh, uh, cybersecurity world and, and the information security world. Uh, you know, they, they talk about uh, information sharing, collaboration all the time, and what are some of the risks and, and, and how to do that um, mindfully and, and, and do it well. And I think that we need to do that. I think we need to continue to mindfully uh, look at the data uh, and, and share the data and, and have these uh, discussions and, and these formats uh, that we can have this information exchange uh, so that we're, we're not operating in a vacuum um, and that, and that we're, we're openly discussing what some of these issues are and, uh, and, and what the evidence is. Uh, and, and we all know that that could change. Um, and we all know that uh, we, we need to be uh, mindful about that and, and, and thinking about um, what that means, not only now, but, but two months from now and, and two years from now. So um, as, we, as we're starting to, to hit the top of the hour, I, I wanna stop there um, and, and pause and, and see if there are any other questions or, or comments, um, either John from, from you uh, or, or from any of our other uh, folks who are, who are on the line here uh, this evening. Can you hear me, no John? Of, oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There was that one question. I think number eight that uh, wasn't answered by Tanuj. Oh, sure, sure. So this one is: uh, Are you still going to talk about IV steroid use for acute exacerbations during this pandemic? What What are your thoughts on that, Brian? So that's a great question. I, I think this had sort of changed um, over time. I think initially um, we were we were sort of hesitant um, uh, to do that, um, and I, again it, it goes back to, to the case by case basis, right? Um, I think that um, what what are the patient's potential risk factors for for COVID nineteen? Uh, what are some of the potential risk factors uh, for the use of steroids? Um, some folks don't really advocate the use of steroids at all. Um, and, and so I, I don't know really what the right answer is uh, here. W one of the sort of stop gaps that, that we've been using is uh, if um, we are pretty confident um, that, that a patient is having a true radiographic and clinical exacerbation of their MS, meaning that we are seeing new and enhancing lesions on an MRI scan and they are having uh, the clinical symptoms, um, our 
uh, likelihood of, of using steroids is fairly high. Uh, some folks are advocating the use of uh, a COVID test uh, prior to um, uh, delivering the IV steroids. Uh, and, and certainly if they're COVID negative and, and we, at our institution, we're able to get uh, these tests back pretty darn quickly, like sometimes within 24 hours, um, we're, we're able to determine. And so if I'm, you know, delaying IV steroids, uh, you know, 24 to 48 hours uh, in a patient with known clinical and radiographic um, uh, relapse uh, in order to, to put um, somebody on, on steroids, um, I, I think that that's, that's sort of our safe way of doing it. Um, and, and so, uh, that, that's how we're approaching things right now. Uh, so if, if it is um, a, a confirmed clinical and radiographic exacerbation and we can demonstrate fairly quickly that, that they're COVID negative, um, then, then that lends us a little bit more confidence to be able to treat them uh, clinically with IV steroids. Um, I, John, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if anybody else has thoughts on that, but that's, that's what we're doing. Yeah, and I'll just add to, to what you're saying. I mean, there's there's published literature well before COVID-19 showing that uh, high-dose oral prednisone at 1,250 milligrams is uh, no, not inferior to, you know, your standard 1,000 IVMP. So knowing, of course, there is a risk for various types of infections when you administer high-dose steroids. But the benefit is, of course, that you're just giving them high-dose oral steroids and allowing them to administer at home. Yeah, which is what everybody really wants now. I had uh, a friend of mine who happens to have MS, and um, she was uh, terrified about having an MRI. She was worried that the MRI wouldn't be clean enough. And, uh, you know, so there's lots of fear out there. Definitely. Yeah. So... You know, I think uh, this was just an unbelievable <laughs> presentation. Uh, thank you for the great slides. Uh, we will be able to post them with your permission for those who uh, would like to spend more time in reading them. Um, we can post them uh, probably early next week on the uh, www.cmscholar.org, if uh, that would be okay with the two of you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, That'd be I'm, great. I'm, I'm, Good. Yeah, and I absolutely. think, you know, for those of you out there, uh, John and, and uh, Brian created this journal club uh, to try to get more engagement by our audience. We would love to hear back from you. I know you want to fill out your evaluations and claim your credits, but we'd also like to hear back from you about topics you'd like to cover or any other suggestions how we can uh, make this a pleasant and learning experience for all of you. It is interactive. And I think, John and um, Brian, next time maybe we'll put the phone lines on so we can try to get some people to call in. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, yeah. I'm sure people are sick of hearing me talk. So. <laughs> it's our third you know, round with this uh, journal club, and um, we'd love to learn with all of you how we can make it better because it is yours. We did put this together because we thought it's something that our membership would like to participate in. So please give us feedback. So, John and Brian, would you like to say some closing words before we uh, get cut off? <laughs> no, I, I just, again, like to, to thank you, June, and, and CMSC, and I'd like to thank John uh, for, for helping spearhead this whole thing. And, and I really would like to thank everybody who, who called in and, and who's uh, sharing their time this evening on a random Wednesday night. Yep. John? Yeah, I just also want to say thank you so much for all your support in this. And uh, when we first hatched this idea, we, we had no idea a pandemic was coming. But I feel like this type of platform is now uh, even more relevant than it was six months ago. So thank you again. Absolutely. No, no thank you. So I wish everybody good night. Everybody be safe. Please uh, shelter in place if you have to. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and, uh, you know, and help us make everything get better. And uh, let's, I'm looking forward to our next meeting. Thanks a lot, everybody, and we'll say good night.